Um, thanks for coming. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Jonathan Schreier, who is a Dartmouth 85, to use our lingo, that I'm starting to get very comfortable with now. Um, Jonathan, in addition to graduating from Dartmouth in 85, um, is currently the acting special representative for global food security at the U.S. State Department, where he has been heavily uh, involved in the Feed the Future initiative, which was founded uh, during the first uh, Obama administration. Prior to this, he was actually heavily involved in the development of the uh, energy and climate uh, initiatives, also started under the Obama administration. So he has a very uh, diverse background, and having talked with Jonathan several times actually already today, I'm aware that he has a lot of interesting things to say about these topics, and so that being the case, I will not take up any more of his time uh, and let him take it away. So, Jonathan. Thank you. It's great to be back in Hanover. Um, although uh, uh, either I've gotten soft living south of the Mason-Dixon line in Washington, D.C., um, or, or the climate has changed here. Um, so uh, uh, I wanted to talk today about um, the uh, uh, efforts that the U.S. has been making in the fight against hunger, poverty, and undernutrition. Today, nearly 842 million people, or one out of eight people on the planet, suffers from chronic hunger. Seventy-five percent of the world's poor live in, in developing countries and in rural areas where they rely on their livelihoods for, uh, for, uh, for, on their work in agriculture. We also live in a world where one in four children, or 165 million of the world's children under the age of five, is stunted. Nearly half or 45% of all child deaths have their roots in undernutrition. The, UN, uh, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimates that 1.3 billion tons of food each year, roughly one third of the food produced for human consumption, is lost or wasted. And in developing countries, this happens mostly before food reaches the markets thereby robbing farmers of the profits to be gained through their hard work to produce the food. It's also the case that the number of people in the world who are food insecure in urban areas, currently around 200 million, is expected to grow as people move from, from uh, poor rural areas to the world's cities in search of greater economic opportunities. And by 2050, by mid-century, the world's population is projected to increase to more than 9 billion, and over 70% of that population will be urban. Most of the world's population growth will occur in developing areas of the world, and dietary choices in those areas are changing. And together, this increase in population and changes in dietary choices will increase global demand for food to an extent that will require a 60% increase in food production, as estimated by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. So as, as a growing number of developing countries undergo rapid economic transitions and people's uh, food choices change, some developing countries are starting to experience what the FAO describes as a double burden, a double burden of malnutrition the persistence of undernutrition, lack of the right nutrients, particularly among children, alongside a rise in obesity or overweight uh, and diet-related chronic diseases. So just producing more food and providing more calories alone is not enough. Nutrition matters too. We're facing these challenges as the world's natural resources, water, land, and ecosystems become strained from the effects of climate change in addition to population growth. Fisheries as well as land-based food production systems are threatened as increasing ocean temperatures affect rain patterns and acidification affects aquatic life, threatening another potential source of animal protein. 
According to a recent report from the World Bank, high temperature extremes in the tropics will lead to significantly larger impacts on agriculture and ecosystems in many developing country regions located in tropical and subtropical areas. Sea level rise is likely to be 50 to 20 percent larger in the tropics and increasing aridity and drought are likely to occur in tropical and subtropical areas. In fact, economies of many rural communities throughout the developing world depend on rain-fed crops and, and fisheries and livestock herding, sectors that are all heavily affected by changes in the global climate. For example, Southeast Asia is a region particularly vulnerable to climate change. By 2050, the population is projected to reach 760 million, and 65% of that population will be concentrated in cities along the coast. A 30 centimeter sea rise in sea levels projected by 2040 is likely to reduce rice production in the Mekong River Delta, the region's main rice growing area, by 11%. So we've got a lot of challenges out there. And responding effectively to these interrelated challenges requires an approach that addresses them holistically and requires cooperation across sectors with multilateral organizations, partner countries, meaning the developing countries themselves, civil society, and the private sector to pursue a common agenda for action. Studies show that growth in the agricultural sector is on average up to twice as effective in reducing poverty as compared to growth in any other sector. Investments in agriculture and related infrastructure and markets are crucial to generate opportunities for economic growth that can help reduce poverty and hunger. Nutrition, especially during the critical 1,000 days window from the start of a mother's pregnancy to her child's second birthday is important because it can be the difference between a child's ability to grow, learn, and move out of poverty or face a future that is permanently stunted. So increasing our understanding of how to improve household dietary quality is also key. We need to transform production systems to use, imports, sorry, to use inputs more efficiently, reduce post-harvest losses, and maintain critical ecosystem services that are more resilient to climate change. Otherwise, we risk the sustainability of our investments in agricultural development and food security, and the future long-term economic growth and well-being of the populations that we're trying to help. Science and innovation can help us meet the demand for nutritious food for a growing world population. Focusing on smallholder farmers and sustainable intensification, an approach that increases agricultural productivity while optimizing the use of natural resources can help transform food systems and address the relationship between poverty, hunger, malnutrition, agriculture, and climate change. And the US has committed itself to being a leader in this area. Hunger and undernutrition are challenges we can solve. We need to ensure that hunger, poverty, and undernutrition are no longer obstacles to shared prosperity, security, and growth. Ending hunger and undernutrition is in our national security and economic interests. In fact, investments in economic growth, poverty reduction, and improved health in developing countries are critical to U.S. national prosperity, stability, and security. The U.S. is using its comparative advantage in research, science, and technology to solve the critical challenges to food systems and increase the availability of nutritious foods while addressing the impacts of climate change on agriculture and the impacts of agriculture on climate change. President Obama has been a strong advocate for food security, making the case for increased investments in agriculture and nutrition because they impact lives and livelihoods. They help move people out of poverty, create stronger communities, and open new markets. Our efforts to date have helped put food security and nutrition high on the global agenda. <clears throat> 
In 2009, at the G8 summit in L'Aquila, Italy, President Obama called on global leaders to reverse declining public investment in food security and nutrition. And he announced that the United States would increase our own investments in this area. This commitment laid the foundation for Feed the Future, the US government's whole of government initiative to address global hunger and food insecurity. It also helped leverage commitments from other donor governments that together totaled more than $22 billion over a three-year period. With a focus on smallholder farmers, particularly women, Feed the Future supports 19 focus countries in developing their own agricultural sectors to generate opportunities for economic growth and trade, which can help reduce poverty, hunger, and undernutrition. We work to achieve this by supporting the food security priorities of our host countries promoting collaboration at the U.S. domestic and international levels, focusing on women as part of the solution, engaging with the private sector and civil society in a meaningful way, and advancing big ideas through research and innovation. By, support, by supporting stronger markets, better infrastructure, and new technologies, Feed the Future is helping equip communities with the tools, the knowledge, and the enabling environments that they need to thrive in times of prosperity and to overcome difficulties in times of hardship. Through this approach, Feed the Future helps communities become more resilient. This means our valuable food aid, the short-term aid that we give to people in crisis, can be used for un unforeseen catastrophes rather than chronic food insecurity and predictable cycles of drought or flooding. Led by the U.S. Agency for International Development, Feed the Future is a whole of government initiative that har harnesses the expertise and resources of 10 different agencies, including the U.S. Departments of Agriculture, Commerce, State, and Treasury, the Millennium Challenge Corporation, the U.S. Africa Development Foundation, the Peace Corps, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, and the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative. These 10 agencies are all working together to ensure that the U.S. government's efforts targeting food security and nutrition are coordinated effectively and deliver real results. Let me tell you a little bit more about what it is that we're doing. Uh, first, we are working to reduce poverty and global hunger through innovation, science, and technology. Feed the Future builds capacity in agricultural research, extension, and education, and leads a major effort on scaling up agricultural technology adoption to sustainably transform agricultural production systems, ensuring access to nutritious and safe foods, creating enabling and supportive policies, and catalyzing investment from the private sector while, in, while addressing the emerging challenges of climate change and natural resource scarcity. In our 2012 fiscal year, more than 9 million households benefited directly from Feed the Future investments. And in that same year, Feed the Future helped, helped more than 7 million farmers apply new technologies or management practices. We are advancing and scaling up innovation through Feed the Future's research strategy, which supports partnerships across U.S. universities and participating global institutions to address the issues of hunger and poverty through science and technology, especially in agriculture. Through the research strategy, we're, in, we're developing climate resilient cereals to improve resource efficiency and enable farmers to grow more cereals on less land using fewer inputs or resources such as fertilizers, water, labor, and energy. We're working to increase the production and availability of nutritious legumes, or including beans, to improve food security, nutrition, soil health, and economic opportunities for poor farmers. We're also advancing technology solutions to major animal and plant diseases, such as new animal vaccines, and by developing crops that are more resistant to pests and plant diseases. We're also improving integrated pest management, which is critical in developing countries where pests can have devastating impacts on agriculture 
and therefore on the livelihoods of smallholder farmers who lack access to agrochemicals. Our research program on nutritious and safe foods focuses on improving the production and safe processing of nutritious agricultural products and, uh, and on increasing our understanding of the role of fruits, vegetables, meat, fish, dairy, and legumes uh, in improving diet quality. In this area of nutrition, uh, it, it's no surprise then that one of the overarching goals of Feed the Future is to reduce undernutrition. So we have worked to integrate agriculture and nutrition programming and prioritize building the evidence base to show what kinds of nutrition interventions and what kinds of policy uh, changes work to improve human nutrition. For example, we incorporate nutrition outreach and behavior change with agricultural investments. We invest in value chains that improve the availability of high quality staple foods and build capacity to monitor and evaluate national nutrition programs. In our 2012 fiscal year, Feed the Future Nutrition programs reached over 12 million children under the age of five. The U.S. government remains committed to, to providing strong support for nutrition interventions and making smart, integrated investments in agriculture programs that help to increase our impact in this area. Feed the Future investments are expected to accelerate trends in stunting reduction, ultimately reducing the stunting of children by 20% over five years in the areas in which we work. And this, translates, this will translate into two million fewer stunted children. This work also supports the World Health Assembly's goal to reduce child stunting by 40% globally by 2025. Let me give you one example in the area of nutrition from a project that USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, has been working on. Our Feed the Future program in Zambia includes a, an effort to demonstrate the benefits of orange maize, corn, that is orange in color, and these varieties provide higher levels of vitamin A precursors that the body converts into vitamin A. These new varieties are also high yielding disease resistant, and drought tolerant, reducing farmers' vulnerability to threats like reduced rainfall. The project, the project partners uh, with local seed companies, and these seed companies multiply the orange maize seed so that they can start supplying other farmers in the country, and ultimately farmers beyond the country. And I, I mentioned that this orange maize helps reduce vitamin A deficiencies. Vitamin A deficiencies can lead to the loss of vision and can also lead to impaired immune function. And in Zambia, it's a real public health threat that, that affects more than 50% of children younger than five. While vitamin A is available in a variety of foods, such as fruits, leafy green vegetables, and animal products, these are often too expensive or simply unavailable in some of Zambia's rural areas. So by providing orange maize, which it can be eaten as a porridge-like staple food known as nshima in Zambia, we can provide half of the average daily requirement of vitamin A for women and children. We're also working with the private sector and working to, to improve the, the enabling environment for private sector activity in the field of agriculture and food security. And this is because private sector investment and participation is crucial in the fight against hunger and undernutrition. Private sector partners bring resources and innovation to the table and can help develop new markets and make our investments sustainable in the long term. Through Feed the Future, over 270,000 270, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises received assistance and access to loans and nearly 250,000 received business development services. In Ghana, we invested in the development of 13 post-harvest facilities for the processing, of, uh, the processing, storage, and marketing of grain, as well as three public pack houses for cold storage, processing, and packaging of fruit. These facilities helped reduce transaction costs between exporters, wholesalers and farmers, improving efficiency in the value chains and 
and by helping post-harvest loss, uh, by helping reduce post-harvest losses, this led to increases in in income for farmers in Ghana. We've forged more than 660 public-private partnerships with local businesses and multinationals to catalyze more than $115 million in agriculture sector investments in Feed the Future countries to finance inputs, machinery, and processing equipment, or to improve land and water management. We also facilitated more than $125 million in loans dispersed to farmers, fishers, and other rural business enterprises. Our innovative loan program in Kenya increased financial access to some of the poorest farmers there. The loan package cost farmers uh, $125 per acre of inputs with a flexible payment schedule. And in just one year, participating farmers saw their profits increase from $120 per acre before the loan to an average of $240 per acre after the loan. Through Feed the Future, we also support the new Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, which was announced by President Obama in 2012. This partnership between African government donors, originally led by the, the group of eight countries, and local and international private sector partners, this partnership known as the New Alliance aims to lift 50 million people out of poverty in sub-Saharan Africa by 2022. The New Alliance aims to achieve these goals through partnerships founded on three areas of mutual commitment through policy reforms by African governments that are transparent and visible and build investor confidence, through responsible investments targeted at reducing poverty and increasing agricultural growth from the private sector, and through coordinated assistance by donor governments to catalyze and expand Africa's potential for sustainable and rapid agricultural growth. So far, the New Alliance has grown into a public-private partnership with over 70 global and local companies that have committed to invest over $3.7 billion to increase smallholder incomes. One example under the New Alliance is in Ethiopia, where the Ethiopian government, USAID, the U.S. Agency for International Development, and DuPont recently opened a state-of-the-art seed processing plant and warehouse that will help 35,000 smallholder farmers gain access to uh, um, uh, better maize seeds that will enable them to increase their yields by as much as 30, sorry, as much as 50 percent. We're also focused on how to achieve inclusive agricultural growth and improve nutrition through enabling policies and by building the capacity of partner governments. To, to effect sustainable change in areas such as land tenure, land use rights, and financial instruments, input policies, and regulatory regimes. U.S. diplomacy is also a critical part of our effort to fight hunger and undernutrition around the world. We work with strategic partner countries, including Brazil, India, and South Africa, to leverage the expertise and influence of these governments, their private sectors, and civil society partners in these countries in order to collaborate to improve food security in Feed the Future focused countries. For example, we have agreements with Brazil to work together in Haiti to improve land use and promote conventional and biofortified crops. And in, we also are working with Brazil in Honduras to increase agricultural productivity decrease malnutrition, and promote renewable energy in rural areas. Both inside and outside the Feed the Future framework of activities, U.S. food security diplomacy actively supports the work of multiple U.S. government agencies to advance global food security by working to promote open markets and engage partner governments, private sector and academic institutions, civil society, and the media in Africa, Latin America, and Asia to promote investments and actions that can address the global challenges of food security and climate change. We promote policy coordination among major donors 
strategic partners, and multilateral organizations, ensuring that food security and nutrition remain high on global agendas and bilateral agendas as well. The United States plays a leading role in the UN Committee on World Food Security uh, and negotiations there, working, uh, including in the area of promoting responsible agricultural investment. Over the past four years, working with the U.S. mission to the U.N. agencies in Rome and in collaboration with the U.S. Agency for International Development and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, we guided the U.N. Committee on World Food Security's consultative process to develop voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of the tenure of land, fisheries, and forestry in the context of national food security. And these voluntary guidelines were approved in May 2012. Now we are working in a similar consultative process to develop voluntary principles on responsible agricultural investment. And these diplomatic efforts are, are crucial to supporting the cause of ending hunger and undernutrition in our time. In addition, the U.S. government takes a whole-of-government approach to partnering with multilateral institutions, mainly the U.N. Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Food Program, and the International Fund for Agricultural Development to do a wide variety of things, including improving agricultural investment and productivity, combating pests and post-harvest losses, and raising nutrition. This cooperation is not limited to the three Rome-based agencies that I mentioned. We're also working with the, with the uh, World Health Organization, for example, on nutrition programs. Through our support of the 1,000 Days Partnership, launched in collaboration with the Government of Ireland, we are supporting the <coughs> United Nations Scaling Up Nutrition, or SUN, movement. Thanks to these efforts, more and more stakeholders from government, civil society, and the private sector are prioritizing nutrition in the critical 1,000 Days from a woman's pregnancy through her child's second birthday, when adequate nutrition has the greatest lifelong impact on a child's health, ability to grow, learn, and make a, a contribution to his or her households, communities, nations, and indeed the world's uh, economic growth and development. The United States has also worked closely with the group of 20 countries, the World Bank, and other multilateral organizations in civil society to establish the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, or GAFSP, a multi-donor trust fund to help millions of poor farmers around the world grow more and earn more so that they can lift themselves out of hunger and poverty. We also are supporting President Obama's new policy for making publicly funded data open and machine readable through an open data for agriculture effort. We're committed to making it possible for anyone to use the agricultural data and related, and related analyses that the U.S. government and taxpayer dollars fund. Sharing data can lead to new innovations and insights. At the State Department, we have our direct line program to allow American businesses, particularly small and medium-sized enterprises, to engage directly with U.S. ambassadors overseas via teleconference. This program is open to American companies already in the countries where the ambassadors serve, or interested companies that are interested in expanding their businesses there. We've hosted agriculture-focused direct line calls with our ambassadors in Zambia, Ethiopia, and Mozambique. So I, I hope I've, I, I, I've uh, helped you to learn more about the wide variety of activities that the U.S. government is engaged in. Hunger and undernutrition are multidimensional issues. Tackling these issues requires a coordinated approach within the government, with other donors, with partner governments, with multilateral organizations, with the private sector, and with civil society. And as you can see, the U.S. government is leading a comprehensive effort to end hunger and to break the cycle of poverty and undernutrition. By supporting stronger markets and new technologies, strengthening collaboration among partners to help spread innovation, leverage resources and expertise, we can help create the enabling environment that will provide opportunities for millions of people around the world with the, by providing them with the tools and knowledge to thrive and ensuring that they have access to nutritious foods 
and the ability to support their families through agriculture. The urgent nature of these issues demands that we continue to do more to embrace and develop smart policies, coordinate among countries and across regions, emphasize innovation, and partner with the private sector and civil society to promote a common agenda for action to stop the cycle of hunger and poverty while addressing climate change and natural resource scarcity. By helping create economic opportunities in developing countries, our collaborative food security efforts generate economic growth and promote global stability, which benefits us all. Hunger, poverty, and undernutrition are problems that we can solve. Because we can solve them, we must. We must act. And this is why the United States, working with partners at home and abroad, is helping to lead in the fight against hunger, the fight to end hunger, poverty, and undernutrition in our times. Thank you. So we have time for questions. I don't know if, if, if you'd like me to lead that. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Um, so we have uh, plenty of time for questions. And so I welcome your, your reactions or questions. Uh, thank you for your talk today. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk more about the voluntary guidelines on land tenure. Um, what exactly are the guidelines and what do developing countries have to do to actually implement them? Is it just a law that they have to pass or is it an international agreement? Right, so uh, um, the idea of the voluntary guidelines, it really came out of a discussion around uh, ensuring that, um, that we were working, first of all, on the, the challenge that the world needs more investment in agriculture. I mentioned the, the need to increase agricultural productivity uh, um, and agricultural production by uh, some 60% by mid-century if we're to feed the growing <laughs> world population with its changing dietary demands. And, uh, um, and, and to ensure that that investment happens, to do our best to promote that investment to happen in ways that, that contribute to solutions and don't undermine progress and don't undermine uh, the, the interests of, of local communities. And in looking at that problem, one of the key issues uh, um, is certainly that around the rights to use land, the rights to access uh, fisheries, the rights to, to make use of forest resources. And so a decision was reached that we needed to address that challenge first. And so the negotiations focused initially around this question of, of land tenure and more broadly tenure rights and usage rights surrounding land, fisheries, and forestry. Um, and what, what resulted from uh, a, a couple of years of, of consultation involving governments, civil society, and the private sector in multiple regions around the world was a set of voluntary guidelines that provided guidance to all stakeholders, including governments in developing countries, governments in developed countries, private sector actors, uh, um, civil society actors, and others on, on, on uh, issues that, uh, that need to be thought through, need to be addressed, um, recommendations on ways to approach those issues uh, uh, surrounding land, uh, land use rights and systems for helping to manage those rights so that, uh, um, you know, in the United States, um, uh, if, you, if you think back to uh, um, when your parents bought a house or if you've bought a house, um, there was a, a titling process and a deed and uh, that was based on someone doing a survey that marked out the, the exact dimensions of the land involved um, and a registry system for uh, recording the, those, those, those uh, parameters so that then if there were ever a dispute, there would be records and, 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 and facts to go on. Not every country has those systems in place. Um, so providing guidelines on, on development of sound administrative systems is part of the voluntary guidelines. Um, there are also uh, recommendations embedded in those guidelines for ways of, of ensuring consultation with local communities as land use uh, or access to forestry or fishery resources uh, decisions are being made so that there is a, a, a fuller consideration of all the implications of some potential change in those uh, 
um, uh, 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 usage systems or, or, or for land, fisheries, and forests, and, and so on. And wh what was subsequently developed was a, a set of, uh, of operational guidelines that goes into considerably more detail, a set of resources based at the, the, um, the FAO in, in Rome to help countries think through how to implement these systems and also to give guidance to other stakeholders, as I mentioned, private sector and, and civil society stakeholders involved, to help improve uh, um, uh, land tenure systems around the world. Um, having gotten that piece of this broader challenge out of the way through the uh, adoption of these voluntary guidelines, we, we then turn to the broader question of responsible agricultural investment, and those are the consultations going on right now. So there's uh, um, been a series of consultations going on regionally around the world. We just held a North American regional consultation in Washington, D.C. and Ottawa, Canada, um, to uh, um, uh, get input from civil society and private sector stakeholders in the U.S. and Canada in North America um, around a set of, 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 of voluntary principles for responsible agricultural investment, and that's the negotiation that we're into now with an aim of finalizing this set of voluntary principles by October of this year so that it can be adopted and then put into, made available for use by governments um, and, and, and other stakeholders. Thanks. Another question in the back, and then we'll move on? to a different part of the room. Is it on? Okay. It is on. <laughs> we can hear you. Um, so you spoke a bit about collaboration and the emphasis on whether it's intergovernmental for the organizations mm -hmm. that support Feed the Future or externally between the relationships of, I think you said Brazil, South Africa, India, and mm -hmm. also the United States. So collaboration has definitely been a big selling point on development efforts. Um, mm -hmm. IMF also does that too with the uh, PRSPs. So if you were to do like some sort of cost benefit analysis between the efforts of the United States and their partnerships with other nations um, in regards or comparison to what the IMF does with those similar collaborative efforts, how would you say the difference or where does the difference lie? Like what are the benefits of working towards solving these problems as a singular country actor as opposed to through an international organization like the IMF or World Bank? Right, uh, so um, there, there are differences, uh, um, uh, they're, 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 and uh, they are, they're, they're, they have a number of different dimensions. Um, so, uh, so one difference is uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, the U.S., when, when we engage in a development activity, first of all, directly, uh, bilaterally, just the U.S. and Tanzania, for example, um, we, we know exactly, we, we, we are involved in designing that, that effort and uh, one, of the, one of the new approaches that's embedded in Feed the Future and really has been generally accepted globally as best practice in development is that we are aligning our efforts with the country's own efforts. Um, so uh, um, we are aligning our work in Tanzania behind Tanzania's priorities for development in the, in the field where I work. That means their agricultural development, food security, and nutrition priorities. Um, uh, and so, we, we, so first of all, we, even when it's just a purely bilateral relationship, we're engaging it, in it more collaboratively than we did in the past because we make sure that we're working against the country's own priorities. When we, uh, um, and, and uh, you know, presumably the, the World Bank or the IMF, uh, I mean in development space it's more the World Bank than um, the IMF which tends to engage more in, in financial uh, uh, um, areas than, than uh, um, operational development activities. Um, but uh, you know, presumably the World Bank tries to do that too, to align behind the country's own priorities, but we know it for sure when we do it ourselves. Um, when we work with another emerging donor, such as Brazil, um, there are multiple benefits. Um, one of the benefits is Brazil knows things that we don't know, or Brazil knows certain things better than we do. So Brazil has um, a, a remarkable record of excellence in tropical agriculture. 
they know tropical agriculture better than we do because other than Hawaii and a, a few other far-flung parts of the United States, the United States territory is predominantly not tropical. Um, witness the weather outside today. Um, and, uh, and so uh, you know, we might have more to say to someone who needed some, some uh, Arctic uh, <laughs> uh, uh, territory uh, agricultural assistance, but Brazil knows more than we do about tropical agriculture. So we can benefit from that Brazilian knowledge by collaborating with them and, and thereby leveraging their knowledge for the benefit of a population we're trying to help in Mozambique. And that's one of the areas that we've been working with with uh, Brazil is trilateral cooperation in Mozambique. Um, we also get the benefit that's, that um, uh, these key emerging donors are emerging. They are, they, their development agencies are often quite new. In the case of South Africa, they've been talking about creating a development agency. They haven't yet established it. Um, they've been planning to establish a development agency. In the case of Brazil, the, um, the, the Brazilian agency, so you, you know, a lot of people uh, say that uh, we came up with a really clever name for the name of our Agency for International Development, AID. Um, Brazil also gets some credit for a clever name. In Brazilian, uh, um, the, the letters for the Brazilian Cooperation Agency come out as ABC, um, and uh, ABC is a relatively newer, relatively smaller development agency. Um, they get to see how a, a very experienced uh, um, agency like AID with long history and, and a, a lot of practice in developing best practices in development does its work. And that benefits us all because it means over time ABC becomes a stronger partner in development efforts globally. Um, so collaboration also helps in that way. And we, we of course also collaborate with international institutions. Uh, I mentioned some of the work that Feed the Future is doing in research and development. A lot of that research and development ends up being done collaboratively with the international agricultural research institutions that are part of the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, CGIAR, a network of international research centers. Um, so for example, uh, um, USAID uh, working with um, uh, uh, DuPont and the, um, the, uh, uh, the, the research center known as CIMIT, C-Y-M-M-Y-T, -M -M the, the, which has a Spanish name that means uh, the research center for maize and, and wheat, um, uh, is working, we, we are working collaboratively to uh, um, develop uh, um, drought and heat tolerant wheat varieties that will then be deployed in uh, Feed the Future efforts internationally. Um, so we do work with international organizations collaboratively as well. So collaboration is just part of our, our general approach. Thanks. Another question here. How does the distribution of um, technologies such as these climate resistance seeds, how does that work? Is it something where Feed the Future gives a donation or a grant to the country's government, or, or does it work through other um, more local organizations? Yeah, it, it varies from place to place. Um, one of the ways that we uh, do this is um, uh, through public-private partnerships. So um, I mentioned the example of, of, of uh, uh, DuPont in, in Ethiopia, um, where, uh, um, we, where, where DuPont is uh, helping to develop a, a network of seed distributors, seed multipliers. Those are the people who take a few seeds and turn them into a large quantity of seeds by planting the plants for seed production rather than for consumption. Um, uh, we we uh, um, also invest in um, helping countries develop seed certification systems so that they can, do, they can set up the laboratories and, and, and uh, other systems needed to certify that the seeds are high quality so that then when farmers buy the seeds, they know that these are seeds that are worth the extra money. So you see the, the um, transition of some farmers from um, uh, historical, traditional practices of, of simply saving the seeds that were handed down through the generations um, to buying 
improved seeds, seeds that have desirable traits such as climate resilience, heat tolerance, drought tolerance, flood tolerance in some areas where rising sea levels are a problem, or uh, tolerance to higher salt levels in the soil. Um, and, uh, um, and, and so the farmers are seeing the value of purchasing higher quality seeds because they, they see that they produce more over time and, and so they, even though it costs them a little more upfront than zero from saving seeds, the production increase um, more than makes up for it um, when, when they sell that seed, when they sell the re resulting production into the market. Um, and so we, again, to answer your question, we use a mix of models from public-private partnerships to work with the governments, for example, in setting up these uh, um, uh, seed systems. Uh, we also work with the uh, governmentally backed research centers in the countries in which we work because when you develop a new seed, you still um, may have to further develop it and adapt it to local conditions. Um, uh, you know, there are a lot of dimensions to seed productivity, plant productivity um, that the non-specialist might not really tune into um, until you think about it. So for example, you develop a, a high quality seed in a warm area of of Florida, and you figure, good, I can just export it to anywhere in the world, um, and it'll work about the same if the temperature levels are about the same. Well, no, if, you, um, if it was developed in Florida and you go closer to the equator, somewhere in equatorial Africa, um, the change in day length, um, daylight uh, length might be sufficient to throw off the productivity of that plant. So until you test it in the local environment, and potentially further adapt it, um, you may not have the, the result you need. And, and so that all happens in, in um, collaboration with the national agricultural research systems of the countries in which we work. And, and so that can be part of the, the vector for getting those seeds into widespread usage in a country. Other questions, maybe from a different part of the room? So I was wondering how Feed the Future balances between uh, basically issues, well, issues in agriculture right now and issues in agriculture under climate change. So I could imagine that there are people who are interested in the year 2100, like mm -hmm. researchers that are interested in how we're going to adapt. And then there are people on the ground that say, we, we can't feed our people right now. Uh, we'd prefer that you just give us more fertilizers or um, you know, kind of build that cold storage, and there'll be some overlap there for sure. Uh, but how do you balance basically your investments between short-term agriculture and long-term agriculture? Right. Um, so, so there, there, <coughs> there are. There, there. We do have to think about both the the short term and the long term. Um, uh, but uh, one of the, you know, one of the powerful things about working on the fight against hunger and undernutrition is the the ability to see change happen in the here and now. A lot of our work can have a very near-term impact, positive impact, um, and that can include things that are designed to increase resilience over the longer term to impacts of, of changing climate and extreme weather events and, and so on. Um, and, uh, uh, and so this um, uh, this can include uh, the, the, the very substantial budget that we, uh, the, the very substantial portion of our research and development budget that is devoted to drought and heat tolerant cereals, um, where uh, that, that's a problem that we need to address now, but it will also create greater resilience over the longer term. Um, and, uh, and so the trade off becomes less pronounced than it might appear at, at, at first sight. Um, and you know, again, when you think about uh, the fact that, that, that some of these impacts of climate change are visible in the here and now, we had uh, in, in East Africa, in the Horn of Africa, two years ago in 2011, we had the worst drought in 60 years. Um, you know, uh, climate scientists will tell you you can't attribute any individual uh, um, weather event or even a months long uh, uh, event to the, the, the long-term impacts of, of global climate change, but we're certain, certainly seeing greater frequency of, of these kinds of extreme events. 
Um, and, and so the work that we're doing, whether it's helping with improved crop varieties or helping, you know, we help with other ways that are not based in the science and technology side of Feed the Future. We're helping uh, um, livestock herders in these areas to approach their herds, their, their herd management differently in times of, of, of crisis caused by drought. So for example, um, the traditional approach to uh, a drought by a, a livestock herder in, a tr in, an, in an area where household wealth has traditionally been um, embodied, literally, in the, in the, 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 the livestock, uh, the, the living livestock, the stock on, on the hoof. Um, the natural reaction in a time of crisis is to hold on to your wealth. Well, what happens then as the drought persists over a period of months, those animals get thinner and thinner, and the value of your wealth actually diminishes. Um, and so by the time you try to sell them in desperation, they have less value, and, 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 you've, and you've gotten yourself in a worse situation. So uh, there have been Feed the Future interventions to help farmers consider the option of selling at the start of a drought problem, um, which, which then gets them more value, and then they can retain the money instead of retaining the livestock to try and see themselves through the, the, the period of drought. Um, so that's an example of a short-term intervention, but if it uh, um, is adopted over, over, over the, the decades, could help communities become better adapted to uh, uh, the, the potential for further increases in, in uh, instances of drought over time. So it also helps with the long term. Other questions, please. Could you talk a little bit about the 1.3 billion tons, I think it was, of food that gets wasted? How does that get wasted? Where does that get wasted? Sure. What's going on? Yeah, so the, the question was on uh, food waste and food loss. Um, uh, um, I, I had mentioned a figure of 1.3 billion tons. Um, so basically, uh, um, the, the, the experts use uh, try, try to draw a distinction between food waste, which is what happens when you uh, um, put some leftovers in the back of the refrigerator and forget about them, um, or buy that uh, um, piece of meat at the supermarket, put it in your freezer, and the next year you find it in the back of your freezer and you throw it away, you've wasted that food. Um, and so food waste is a problem that, uh, or you go to the restaurant and they serve you that, uh, you know, 16 ounce sirloin steak and you only eat a few bites of it and then it gets tossed in the, in the dumpster in the back of the restaurant. Um, so oversized portions. Um, those kinds of phenomena are phenomena of developed countries, rich countries. And, and so we use the term food waste to apply to those kinds of problems. Food loss, um, uh, post-harvest loss, more precisely, um, is a problem that uh, tends to happen much more in developing countries. And it's, um, uh, it's a problem that happens uh, because people are poor, they may not, have, uh, may not have access to the systems needed to preserve their uh, harvest from the time it's harvested until it gets to market. That, those problems might arise because of inadequate market linkages, so they don't have the roads, they, they've got a dirt path, maybe a donkey or some other um, uh, beast of burden to pull a cart across that path. Maybe they're moving the product um, by human uh, um, effort. Um, but they don't have the, the um, transportation linkages to market. Um, they don't have the storage facilities. Um, they, they, uh, um, uh, and, and sometimes the interventions needed to help address these kinds of problems. Um, and, and they don't have the protection against pests that might consume the produce before it gets out of the storage facility and into a market. Um, and so some of the solutions to these kinds of problems are relatively low cost or can be. And so people have developed innovative, low cost pop-up silos um, and, and other things that can help with the storage of, of, of uh, agricultural products, um, uh, especially in developing country contexts. Um, if you just protect it from rain or if you um, provide a facility for drying out the grain so it doesn't rot while it's piled up. Um, these sorts of things can, can be developed. I, I visited a research center in India, you know, again, exa um, exemplifying the way that our collaboration with some of these emerging donors can be very valuable because uh, solutions developed in an Indian context often include 
uh, certainly India has enormous high-tech uh, um, uh, uh, research going on. Uh, they also have a lot of development of low-cost um, uh, um, technologies, including in the field of agriculture, that are designed to be useful in Indian contexts where uh, you can have many parts of the country where um, uh, poverty remains a severe problem, um, and so low-cost solutions are needed. And if we can get some of those solutions out of India into other developing country contexts, that can be very, very valuable. So I visited a, an Indian research institute that was developing um, uh, drying facilities, low-cost drying facilities for grains um, that involve setting up a chimney effect and, and uh, um, having a solar-powered fan help draw the air through the, the, the system so that the, the drying was made more efficient. Um, and so w w we're actually still working to get a better handle on the scale of this problem of post-harvest losses, but we already are making enormous progress in developing solutions to the problem. I see uh, that, the, am I right that the end time is scheduled for about now? I, I, no, we still have more time? Okay, good. So I'm happy to keep taking questions as long as you've got them in the front and there's a microphone coming. Um, I want to go back to the topic of, we were talking about food waste for developed countries. Mm. So I work in the class of 1953 comments in the dish room. Mm. So I just see all the food come back yeah. and people just don't finish it. And, and it's, you talked a lot about the solutions for the food loss, but like, it seems like for food waste, a lot of the cause of that problem is just just choices, just mm -hmm. you know, forgetting that that's left over, or just like taking too much food in a buffet and just leaving it out. So like, what can we do to combat that? And if people are better with their choices, how can we make sure that these food are this food that would have been wasted is going to the people who need it? Right. So um, that's something that in my role, you know, I work at uh, what, what amounts to the U.S. Uh, um, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, so, uh, and, and, that, um, and, and I'm specifically working on a, de a developing, developing country-focused uh, initiative. Um, uh, but, but here at home in, in the U.S., there are certainly organizations that are trying to come up with solutions to food waste in the United States. Um, it's uh, um, everything from uh, just simply for home use, better, better uh, storage um, approaches uh, that, that can help ensure that when you find that piece of meat in the back of the freezer that it's actually still fresh enough to use so you don't throw it away. Um, uh, reconsideration uh, or calls to reconsider uh, uh, labeling uh, rules on, on uh, best if used by or um, sell-by date systems for, for perishables, um, which can sometimes lead people to throw away food that might still be perfectly safe to eat, but, uh, um, but, but uh, because they see that sell-by date or use-by date, they, they toss it um, to uh, um, organizations that um, make arrangements to collect food at uh, um, restaurants or cafeterias or whatever. Um, that would otherwise be dumped, you know, when it's, I mean, it's one thing if it's on the plate with, uh, with teeth marks in it, you probably don't want to send that on to a, to, a, to a homeless shelter or something. Um, but if it's still on the steam table and it's going to get dumped because it doesn't look appetizing enough, but it's still perfectly edible, um, there are uh, organizations that collect food and, and deliver it to, to homeless shelters. and. Um, uh, sometimes it involves uh, um, mobile technologies where they can kind of track real time uh, the, the uh, availability of, of such foods and the needs in shelters in a particular locality um, so that the food can get from point A to point B while it's still, still fresh and usable. Other questions? All right. Well, I, I encourage you to um, think about ways that you can get involved in the, in the fight against hunger, whether at home and abroad, um, because it really is one of those problems that we can solve. And um, so whether that's serving in, uh, in, a, in a local uh, um, homeless shelter or, or, or food kitchen, um, or getting involved in the international fight um, by getting involved with one of the many uh, organizations, um, civil society organizations, or 
joining the U.S. government if you're in, in that kind of a situation and helping directly in the, in the fight against hunger. We need all the help we can get. So thank you for your time and attention.